from the campus of American Baptist College, News Channel 5, The Tennessean, and the League of Women Voters present the Nashville Mayoral Debates. Now, here are your moderators, Rory Johnston and David Plazas. Thank you, everyone, and good evening to you at home, everyone, and welcome to American Baptist College, an historically black college with a rich history in Nashville's civil rights struggle. The school is located here on the banks of the Cumberland River in North Nashville, and important to note, will celebrate its 100th anniversary next year. I'm News Channel 5's Rory Johnston. And I'm David Plazas from the Tennessean. Thank you for joining us tonight in the third of the Nashville mayoral debates. That's right. The city of Nashville will soon, very soon, have a new mayor. Early voting starts next week, next Friday to be exact, but polls suggest nearly half of all voters are still undecided. Hopefully, tonight's debate will help you make up your mind. Over the next 90 minutes, we're going to hear from eight of the top candidates in this race. Let's introduce you to the candidates right now, starting with Alice Rowley, former state economic development official under Governor Bill Haslam, Freddie O'Connell, District 19 Metro Council member, Heidi Campbell, Tennessee State Senator, Matt Wilshire, former economic development director for the city of Nashville, Sharon Hurt, at-large Metro Council member, Jim Gingrich, retired COO of Alliance Bernstein, Vivian Wilhoyt, Davidson County Property Assessor, and Jeff Yarborough, Tennessee State Senator. And our goal tonight, as in our previous debates, is to cover as much ground as possible, but tonight with a focus on the specifics. Every candidate will answer every question, and they will have 90 seconds to do so. First question tonight, one of the biggest criticisms of Nashville in recent years has been the focus on downtown development at the expense of our neighborhoods. Each of you have said you will work to change that, but what specifically will you do to ensure things like sidewalks are a priority in every Nashville neighborhood? And we will begin with Alice. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me here tonight, and uh, I'm delighted to receive that question first. Uh, the aspect I think that's most frustrating for Nashville residents about the way that our city operates is that frequently, um, instead of solving a problem, we're explained how there are 60 different departments that work separately. And so I think in terms of getting to a result of more sidewalks and more potholes filled and our tax rate under control, starts with thinking first of the residents who live here and how they interact with city government. That means making a customer-focused city government that begins first with thinking about how many feet can we lay in a day of sidewalks? What is the most cost-effective way to get that done? And how are we accountable to all of the neighborhoods in Nashville in a really transparent way? And so I'd like to continue to do that. Freddie O'Connell. Roy, thanks. Um, this is, I understand Nashvilleians' frustrations and having represented the urban core, a couple things are true. We've done a very good job of making sure that downtown has the capacity to allow for investments in other parts of the city. We haven't always followed through on that promise though, but some of what I'm going to do is continue fights that I've been engaged in already. A uh, recent Metro Capital spending plan, we had uh, $15 million proposed for a private parking deck at the Nashville Zoo. Well, our family loves the Nashville Zoo. We've been members for years, uh, but it's one of the most dangerous corridors in the city, and our only public investment on that corridor was to invite more cars into it with no considerations for pedestrians. Uh, the Caldwell Abbey Hall neighborhood just around the corner bills itself as the zoo neighborhood, but families in the zoo neighborhood can't walk to the zoo. So I fought for $12 million to be redirected into Vision Zero investments and transit centers that will allow for better crosstown capacity because just a few years ago you couldn't even walk from Nolensville to the zoo. Uh, meanwhile, I will say fighting with colleagues, district council members often know what their communities want but have a hard time uh, working with them to get it. I'm very pr proud that uh, Councilmember Hager uh, got his community center funded in Old Hickory. Councilmember Roten got finally a park at Ravenwood. It's very, very important. Councilmember Sepulveda has fought to get Mariposa Park just named uh, out in her council district. And I think it's really important to make sure that we're listening to the communities and investing all over the city in our 500 square miles. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. This question speaks to the tagline of my campaign, which is, are we building a city to visit or a city to live in? And the answer, of course, is both. 
But we have been focused too long in Nashville on downtown and tourism and not on people who live here. And as somebody who grew up in Nashville, I feel this very deeply when I've seen, you know, downtown grow so rapidly. But Nashvillians are struggling right now to be able to even live here. We're getting priced out of the city. And we have sidewalks that go to nowhere while, you know, downtown has really been um, built up more. So I know that this is really the question of this race. This is the question of the moment. And we need somebody who has municipal experience but can also work with the state on these issues because the fact of the matter is is that we need to be able to fund some of these things. And and, um, and we just passed the largest big transportation bill in the history of our state. I serve on the Transportation Committee in the Senate. And so we actually have some money that we can put into multimodal connectivity and making things better for people who live here. And that's definitely the focus, um, what I want to focus on as your mayor. Matt Wilcher. So Rory, thank you, and David for moderating this, and Dr. Harris and the folks at ABC, thank you so much for having us here today, and to the League of Women Voters and Channel 5, thank you for giving this, us this opportunity to talk about the critical issues facing our city. It is appropriate that we open with this question at this location, because for far too often, there has been insufficient infrastructure invested in sidewalks, in stormwater, in sewers, in areas that have been neglected, neighborhoods that have been neglected for far too long. Downtown has received a lot of investment. It is time for that investment to be realized across the city. When I launched my campaign, I've talked about three things, public safety, public education, and quality of life. Public education is something that touches communities across the county. Every school in every neighborhood should be a great public school. That comes with investment. That comes by prioritizing our children first and making sure that they have sidewalks to be able to get to school without having to walk through traffic. It means that we need to have neighborhoods where there is affordable housing that your kids and grandkids can actually afford to live and grow their families in. And that's what I will prioritize as mayor. It comes with being intentional about what we're trying to do. And I am committed to making sure that every neighborhood and every community across Nashville realizes the same benefits that downtown has had. Thank you. Sharon Hurt. Thank you so very much, and I appreciate being here with you all and uh, Dr. Harris and the American Baptist College family. And I also want to recognize Senator Gilmore for her presence and being here. Um, I think that what we have to do is change the way we operate in Nashville. I think we need to start with a citizen-centric model as opposed to it being a government-centric model. Because if we think about the citizens first, that means we're putting people first and making people our priority. And that's something that we have not done. I think that for our school kids, as uh, my colleague here said, to have to walk on the road of Ewan Lane when they are going to school, and it is just absurd to me that we've not done more in order to make sure that, that the public safety of our kids are our first priority. I think that we have to use some top quality, a total quality management, where we go from the bottom up as opposed to the top down in our government and start right there at the grassroots. The root of it gives you the fruit of it. If you find out what's there, and if we put what is there at the root, which I believe must begin with love, loving our children, we take care of them first. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be here. It is a great question. At this point, we've knocked on thousands of doors across Nashville, and we hear that concern through every neighborhood. Uh, the fact is we've been growing as a city, but without a plan. And that has caused a series of these pain points, whether or not it is the absence of investment in infrastructure, neighborhoods that now flood that never used to flood, the, the, the congestion that we all feel. The strange thing is, is that we have talked about all of those issues for at least a decade. Many of the folks up here on the stage, in fact, have been part of Metro government or part of been politicians, and we still have those issues. 
and we're past the point of being able to talk about them. The only thing that's different than a decade ago when we were talking about it is that we are now spending 70% more in our city government than we were spending 10 years ago. So the question for you all in the audience is who is actually going to have the courage and the know-how to take on these types of problems? I grew up in a business environment where you were rewarded for delivering results. And who has the capability to actually modernize our metro government so it is more effective and more efficient than what is happening today? You should not be in a situation where you are paying more and getting less. Let's start to grow the city, but with a purpose and a plan. Thank you. Vivian Bullhorn. Good evening. Dr. Harris, News Channel 5, League of Women Voters, Ori, ho, 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 and News Channel 5, Worry and David, thank you for having us for our third, uh, um, our third uh, televised debate. Excited about being here. Let's just say this. When I started this campaign, the two platform that I have used, that is what we need today, is that we must make have stronger neighborhoods and we must have stronger businesses. For so long, we have looked at those two entities as being competing, and they should have never been. When I served on a Metro Council, we were made to think that if you were for neighborhoods, you couldn't be for businesses. When you were for businesses, you couldn't be for neighborhoods. And that was unfortunate because we deserve both. We should have both. And because of the petty politics that was played, that was played we were kicking the can down the road for sidewalks and for infrastructure and causing the parity that was happening in this city to grow further apart. Economic parity is important. We have neighborhoods that live in the same tax district, but they don't get the same services. You compare Bordeaux to Belmont Houston. Bordeaux does not have the services that Belmont Houston has, but they say pay the same tax rate. And let's be clear, it's not just because of the petty politics, it's about choices. So you have to more than, more than be intentional, you must be courageous. And as mayor, I will be courageous and do what is right, closing that gap. Thank Jeff you. Yarbrough. Uh, thank you, and thanks for having us tonight. Uh, for too many people in too many parts of the city, it feels like growth is happening to them and not for them. And I think that the question gets at this sort of uh, pervasive notion that downtown in, in Freddie's district gets all of the love and all the focus and all the attention, and that the rest of the county gets ignored. But I think that, that that somehow misses really what the point is. I don't think that most people in Nashville want us to pit downtown against the rest of the county. I don't think that they want us, that Nashvilleians want to neglect downtown. I think they want to see the same level of strategic planning and coherence and investment in Bellevue and Antioch and Madison and Donaldson that we see on these bigger projects downtown, and I think that's what we're missing. Uh, my favorite question that I've been asked during this campaign, you know, I asked, what do you need from the next mayor? And a woman in Madison just said, I just want to be able to, to go for a walk without having to drive somewhere first. And I think that that gets at the core of what we're not actually providing in terms of quality of life to residents, and we should be much more strategic in doing so. We don't need to build the sidewalks to nowhere. We don't need to have sort of bits and pieces. We need to be much more strategic in thinking through where do we need sidewalks so that people can get you know, from here to there safely, to access transit, to walk their children to school. And I think if we actually have real planning that reaches out and partners with communities, we can turn that around. Our next question is on housing. The cost of housing has reached the crisis level in our city. According to the Alliance for Affordable Nashville, in 2017, 72% of zip codes in Nashville were considered affordable. By 2021, the number had dropped to just 21%. Aside from the obvious answer of increasing funding, what will you do as mayor to create more affordable housing in Nashville? We'll start with Councilman O'Connell with Freddie O'Connell and then come back to Alice Rowling. Thanks, David. I think, the, to your point, it's about more than funding. I think um, I'll start here. Transit is a part of our affordable housing toolkit, and I can say this from the experience of having it be a part of my pathway to home ownership. Uh, when I had paid off undergraduate loans, uh, it was far more cost effective to learn how to use our 
functional, but not nearly as widespread as it needs to be, transit system. And over the period of three and a half years, I saved up enough money for a down payment on a house when it was more affordable. But we can lower the cost of household transportation for a lot of people. The mayor's office uh, has a lot of capacity to do coordination. Uh, we are right now, in some ways, our biggest obstacle to our own affordable housing projects. I've got, uh, in the area I represent, a, an affordable housing project from Clark Memorial United Methodist Church that's ready to go. But as soon as we hit the permitting process, we started grinding in our own gears. And I am working on legislation to make that easy, easier before I leave office. Uh, but the mayor's office can also help with encouraging the maximization of enrollment in programs like our property tax freeze and relief programs for Nashvillians who are 65 and up and on a fixed income. We just raised the income ceiling for that, and it should be a strategic goal of the city to make sure that everyone who is eligible, we know who they are and encourage them to participate, help them wayfind and, and get into those programs and stay in those programs. Uh, meanwhile, we can create a standalone office of housing to be a part of the unified housing plan that is coming out right now. The good news is a lot of our affordable housing task force report items Thank are in progress. Much. Thank you. So many people in this city are struggling with affordable housing that it's an emergency. And we have to take an all hands on deck approach um, to addressing this. And, you know, that means that we have to deal with the other issues of affordability. And let's just be clear when we talk about affordable housing, we're talking about a range of issues. We're talking about, you know, all the way from the unhoused people to people who can't afford to buy a starter home. And there is a large block of people that fall within that, th those parameters. And so um, my office will initially, from the downbeat, uh, do a co comprehensive assessment of our public lands to identify public land where affordable housing would be viable. Um, we need to streamline our permitting process because I talk to developers who would love to build affordable housing, but the permitting process is so onerous and the bottlenecks are so bad that they can't do that. And then we also have to address the issues that are feeding this problem, like childcare and early childhood education. Um, a good friend of mine, she has an amazing job. She, she actually struggled with quitting her job because she couldn't afford to get childcare for her, her daughter, and she was really happy to make a choice between those two things. That, that surely is not what we want to happen for Nashvillians. So we need to address all of these issues because they're all related. Thank you very much. Matt Wilshire. So on a bunch of issues, David, you're going to be asking about what we need to do. And I think the question is, who's actually delivered? As you know, I left a job that I loved uh, four years ago and moved to MDHA to work on affordable housing because I saw this issue four years ago. And it had been an issue that the city had struggled with for some time before that. And in just three years, we were able to help build over 4,000 units that Nashvillians could actually afford. And to your point, it's not just about funding. 500 of those units were in a redevelopment of James Casey Homes through a mixed income approach so that we weren't just suburbanizing poverty and no one was displaced. That was a government investment and improved the quality of life for residents and added to affordable housing. But on top of that, and more importantly, we worked with the private sector to develop 3,500 units of affordable housing across the county. To your point, it is not just about funding. It's about working with the public sector and the private sector together to come together. And this question about permitting is a difficult one, and there have been some real challenges in the permitting process. But we actually, when I was in the mayor's office, passed some legislation with council to get projects that were designated as affordable housing projects moved to the top of the list for permitting. That process expedites permitting for projects that are producing affordable housing. So it is taking approaches like that to actually deliver results. I'm someone who has done that and will continue to do it as your mayor. Thank you very much. Sharon Hurt. And I too have done affordable housing, real affordable housing, and moved that affordable housing to attainable housing with the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. And I think that's what we have to do is create more housing with the underutilized properties that we have, vacant buildings that we have all over. We've got to be intentional about doing housing for those people that need it the most. We want to restore hope and prosperity on every block, in every community, and not leave one person behind. I think what Matt is talking about, perhaps it was affordable back then, but today it isn't. 
and I know that it's not going to be. So what I want to do is increase wages and salaries, have economic equality, equity, and empowerment for all Nashvilleians, because that's going to be very, very important. We have an economic tsunami that is going to hit this city with the East Bank redevelopment, which we've got to ensure that there's going to be affordable and attainable housing there. We've got property in Bordeaux where we can utilize affordable and attainable housing. We recently passed that ooze. I think we got to focus on intergenerational housing because we got people who are living longer and they're working longer, and we need to bring them in together. And we want to preserve housing for those people as well. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. Well, I'm glad that some folks have noticed that we have an affordable housing issue in the last several years. Uh, but if you go back to the 2015 mayoral forums, it was a big issue in those forums. And we were talking about it before that. We have done multiple affordable housing studies in this city. Each one has concluded that it's really bad and it's worse than the last time we did the previous study. And those studies sit on the shelf and they gather dust and we don't do much about it. So we today, as you just said, David, are at a crisis. We, our art teachers, our police officers, our metro workers, the people who serve our city cannot afford to live in the city at this point in time, particularly if they're starting off. And this causes all types of issues in recruiting teachers, recruiting police officers. Folks can't live in the county, so they're commuting into the county. So look, we got to do three things and you have to get on it fast. I mean, we've talked about properly funding the Barnes Fund consistently to turbocharge the nonprofit sector. That needs to continue. We've talked about the East Bank and using land there for affordable housing. We have other land across the city should be considered. But this is now tens of thousands of units, a multi-billion dollar challenge. The only place that has that type of capital is the private sector. And as Heidi said, this should not be the most difficult city to build affordable housing in. There are a whole set of Thank things that much. we can do with the private sector. Vivian Wilhoit? So when I went in as the assessor of property back in 2016, one of the first things that I recognized is that values had appreciated greatly. So I met with NOAA and gave NOAA their agenda. Go out, ensure that people are aware that the tax freeze program and the tax relief program, which was under communicated to all of our community, to make sure that the people knew about those programs knock on the doors, make sure that they were aware. I began to work with Reverend Representative Love to increase the income qualification to ensure that more people can qualify. This was in 2016. Now we sit here in 2023. I continue to work with Representative Love, talking to him year by year to talk about how we need to change our way of how people can qualify who live here. We're talking about people who are already here, people. How do we allow them to be able to stay? And successfully, the income level to qualify for the tax freeze relief has happened. Thank God. But in order for affordable housing, in order for it to be credible, we must increase the stock. It's the simple supply and demand. There's not enough supply. So as the assessor of property, I have recognized and have identified more than 200 parcels that we can use vacant properties and looking at vacant buildings. I said from the very beginning of these forums that we could begin using it these parcels, these empty buildings, and make sure we have transitional housing and affordable housing and workforce housing. I would do that as your mayor. Thank, Thank you. you. Jeff Yarbrough. So I appreciate that the question poses this as a crisis because that's exactly what it is. We are facing a crisis when it comes to housing. And I agree completely with Vivian that right now we just have, we don't have as many places to live as we get people who are looking for places to live and it's putting upward pressure on price across the board from rentals to starter homes to uh, you know el our elderly who are looking to downsize and we are going to have to be serious that the sort of small ball solutions that we have been advancing are nibbling around the edges of a much larger problem so here are a few things that we've got to do and i, I want to be a little bit specific here first we think we're much better at preserving affordability where it is. I think that means that you've got to have to be taking much better advantage of property tax freezes and working with your, some of your nonprofits to rehabilitate homes so that people can stay in affordable housing in the neighborhoods they live in. 
Two, I think we have to make it easier for people to move from renter, renter, from being renters to homeowners. That's uh, financial programs, savings programs, down payment assistance programs, especially for the teachers, firefighters, and cops who make this city work. And it's wrong that they can't live here. And then third, we have to get much more ambitious in the way that we're leveraging land and uh, that is owned by Metro and public dollars to really ramp up the amount of housing that we are building where we've got infrastructure and demand to support it. Thank you. Ellis Rooley? Yeah, so I think of this from three approaches. The first has been stated as around the idea of getting more serious about our government-owned land. Right now, our city government thinks of our land as a collection of departments and not what the highest and best use is for the citizens who live here. So that's a first approach, and specifically, uh, I was with a friend a couple of weeks ago in Donaldson. We have space next to Stanford Elementary Montessori School, and across the street is a teacher who lives there and works at the school. It, putting housing adjacent to schools where we've got additional land makes a lot of sense for our teachers and our first responders. Second, we've got to get government out of the way. And Senator Yarborough here at the state level has done a wonderful job at helping free up some permitting processes. Government is lagging in much of its approach. So to speed the permitting of housing stock requires us taking an entrepreneurial attitude. And then third, to stop making our housing less affordable, we have to stop raising taxes. For the last 15 years, this city government has consistently spent more money than it takes in. And that means that we are not taking an approach that is thinking first of the taxpayers and how we make sure we are managing their dollars so that they can afford to live here. Thank you very much. Next question, Nashville's uh, six month trial period for license plate readers is up on July 22nd. A Metro police say that these LPRs have been a powerful tool in their fight against crime. Specifically, police say more than 70 stolen cars have been recovered, more than 80 people arrested. That's just in the few months they've been using them. But preliminary data from the Community Oversight Board found that the program may be unfairly targeting minority communities. Do you support the continued use of license plate readers in Nashville? And we'll begin with Heidi Campbell. So license plate readers in and of themselves are not a bad thing and they can be very useful, but we do need to make sure that they're being employed in a way that does not in any way discriminate against um, any group of people. And um, that is a problem and that's something that we have to address. It's, um, it's consistent with all of the other issues that we're looking at with public safety right now. Um, and especially employing technology in public safety, which is a good thing if we do it um, with deliberation and making sure that we are putting in um, safety parameters so that people are not discriminated against and so that we do not abuse that. Um, and so I think smart cities technology in general, which LPRs is a part of, um, is a very important thing for us to look at because the efficiencies that we can gain from um, making sure that our emergency response process is as quick as possible are, are so great. Um, that having been said, like anything else, it requires that we think very carefully about how we're doing it and make sure that nobody is getting hurt in the process. Right. Matt Wiltshire. Nashville simply isn't as safe as the city that I grew up in. And we saw terrible acts of violence over this 4th of July weekend. Um, when a city is no longer safe, the other things don't matter. Um, it is vital that we have great schools and affordable places to live. But if this isn't a safe city, everything else falls apart. And far too many people have been victims of crime in this city. Um, it is a terrible tragedy. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned and appropriate that you mentioned the Community Oversight Board. I think utilizing tools like license plate readers to help identify uh, crimes and, and perpetrators of crimes and bring them to justice is important. But it is also important that our police department, which has performed exceptionally in many cases, but has been under-resourced for far too long in this city, it's important that we have trust in the police department. And the Community Oversight Board played a vital role in that. I think the move by the state to overturn what was passed by the citizens of Nashville was absolutely the wrong thing and erodes trust and makes the citizens less comfortable with things like 
license plate readers. So these are integrated into each other. We need to have transparency and accountability so that we can trust the folks who are protecting us. We need to make sure that we have a fully staffed police department because if the city isn't safe, everything else falls apart. Real quick follow. So would you support the continued use of them? Absolutely. With oversight and making sure that okay. there are safeguards protecting the, the citizens of Nashville. Thank you. Sharon Hurt. For me, I am still pondering over this because this became personal for me. For the first um, part of the license plate readers, I guess a couple of years ago when we started talking about them, I voted no each time for the very reasons that the Community Oversight Board stated. And this last time, the final reading of it, I abstained. And many people wondered why. And, I, and it was because in Memphis, they do have license plate readers. And I had a nephew who was killed. And they found the killer by a license plate reader. So I have a personal connection and I do believe that they can be useful, but they have to be appropriately used. I worked with the Haynes Park community, and we were able to purchase cameras for them. We got a grant from MDHA, and I think that they can be used. I know Bell Mead has readers. So I believe that it's useful to have them, but we have to make sure that they do not discriminate and target a certain group of individuals. Because we've got to put hope into each one of those people that we see. When you get to the root of it, you get to the fruit of it. And we've got to restore that hope and prosperity on every block in every community and not leave one behind. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. So we do have a real safety issue in Nashville. Our violent crime rate is 80, 90, or more percent higher than cities I would consider peers, like a Charlotte or an Austin. Our homicide rate 10 years ago was just over 6 per 100,000. Last year it was over 16 per 100,000. Our rate of car theft has doubled. This is an issue that we have to be more serious about. We do need to properly fund and resource the police force, and that includes technology. In 2020, it took, us not, took the police force 9.2 minutes to respond to a shooting. Last year, it was 16 and a half minutes. LPRs show promise. There are legitimate concerns that have been raised that we have to make sure that we deal with properly. But it is ultimately going to be a piece of the solution. The other thing, though, is as a city, we need a comprehensive crime prevention strategy that engages our vulnerable youth. I will have an office in the mayor's office that is responsible for public safety that works with our communities, community partners, departments across Metro, nonprofits, faith-based organizations to proactively work with our youth. That starts with easy things like after school programs and summer programs and summer jobs, but also includes things like gun violence interruption. Thank you. Vivian Bullhook. So this is just another opportunity to tell you again, it was the can kick down the road. In my first term as a council person, I offered up the idea of cameras. A homeless person, excuse me, unhoused person was killed. And it, I felt that the the uh, way to re to we could have been able to solve that problem is to introduce cameras and to use them in such a way that it helps to solve crime. So yes, I would support the license plate readers because I think that is a technology that will help be an added tool to help solve crime and to help keep our community safe. Now there is no doubt as an African American woman, it's not license plate readers that discriminate, it's people. And we're talking about the use of, those, of that equipment to the advantage to discriminate. We can make sure that doesn't happen. Recreating the community oversight board and giving them that type of, ex, that type of authority to review some of the license plate readers and where they are. We also need to make sure that when we do this, that we don't just do it in some communities. We, have them in the, in the reason why people feel like it's discrimination or there is being misdone is because of the fact they're in communities to keep them from going over to Heidi's or my friend here, his community. 
it is very important that we do not discriminate and we use them properly. Thank you. Thank Jeff you. Yarbrough. Uh, with license plate readers, there's, a, there's an issue of technology and there's an issue of trust, and we have to get both right. I think there's no question that this is a technology that can be used to improve public safety. Uh, I also think that anybody who actually has read the recent reporting of how this pilot has gone should be disappointed and a little befuddled that less that we didn't put more work into building trust in the process. Uh, this is something where there should have been a much more coherent and community-based project about making sure that we are deploying these uh, LPRs in the, in the right way, in a way that's going to build safety, that's going to, if we're going to test this very powerful technology that's very invasive to people, people need to trust that law enforcement is going to use that well, and I think we need to make sure that that is happening, and I think that uh, until we see that, I wouldn't want to see a full deployment, but I believe that with leadership, we can build that trust. We can get that done. And it's critical that we actually be using, we have that trust so that we can ensure that our law enforcement has the full range of tools and technologies to keep people safe. If this city gets everything else right, but fails to keep people safe, it doesn't matter that we got everything else right. Uh, if we, we absolutely have to ensure that we have a, a well-qualified, well-compensated, well-equipped police force that's also accountable and trusted and tra with transparency and oversight. And, uh, and that's what we'll get when I'm there. Thank you. Alice Rowley. Yeah, so the um, issue of license plate readers is an issue broadly about crime in our city. Uh, and license plate readers are an aspect to help us think through how we can multiply our depleted police force. We are at least 200 officers short and currently two-thirds of the crimes that are reported are never cleared. That makes criminals more bold and it makes victims feel more helpless. So license plate readers are a promising technology to help multiply our police force. They were in this pilot used in, in a too concentrated area. However, we do have data, as Council Lady Hurt pointed out, from many of our satellite cities within the county that also are actively using license plate readers. I believe in a full countywide deployment of license plate readers, we can learn from the pilot, we can learn from our neighbors in other counties, from Shelby County, from the Belmead City Hall and their police force and others around here because this is not, uh, no one stops from a crime perspective at our county line. They don't see the edge. <clears throat> and so if we can share data and help apprehend violent criminals, and hold people accountable, I believe we can make our city safer. Freddie O'Connell. Thanks, and Rory, this is an interesting question because we've just completed a pilot. Um, to me, that's not the time to say immediately do we continue it. That's exactly the time to say what did we learn? Um, the promise of license plate readers is to look at the balance between privacy and safety. Uh, the number one job of a mayor and government is to keep our citizens safe, and that's why it requires diligent evaluation of these things. When we were considering this on the Metro Council, uh, a wide range, one of the broadest coalitions we've ever seen uh, representing Nashville's diversity came and said it's too soon to do this with too few guardrails. Everyone from Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition to the NAACP to the ACLU uh, said don't do this yet, we're still having a conversation. This is exactly the right time to revisit the concerns that the community has expressed uh, offer more transparency about if we continue the pilot, here's how and why we'll do it. Uh, here's how we'll offer the confidence that we're not uh, doing so in a discriminatory way, that we're doing so in a data-driven way, and that uh, the data that we've gotten from MNPD say decisively that uh, these crimes and suspects that we've uh, apprehended are but for the availability of this particular technology. I think the thing you've got to be careful about is any data that can be persisted can be hacked, and you don't want to have victims, you don't want to have people with medical and health uh, scenarios uh, tracked with their movements around the city, and that's what we need to pay attention to. So, real quick, undecided until further. Undecided until review. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next question is a very broad question, but an important one. What do you think is the single biggest infrastructure challenge facing the city, and how would you address it? Matt Wilshire. Yeah, I think 
The sidewalks are the single biggest challenge right now. Uh, I've met with the head of NDOT who said that we have over 4,000 miles of infrastructure of sidewalks that we need to build. And it's really expensive. Uh, I think that there are, none of these things is, is its own piece. Uh, as mayor, you don't have the luxury of just picking one item. So there are things that we have to do. But sidewalks are absolutely a challenge for our city and how we get around a city because it's related to everything else that we're talking about. It's how do you get to school? How do kids get to school in a safe manner? How do you get to transit alternatives? How can small businesses benefit from folks in their communities getting there without excess parking? Um, and so we need to make sure that we have a great network of sidewalks uh, to get around the county and so that folks can move around their neighborhoods. It's also important to health. Uh, when folks can get out and walk more easily, we're going to have a healthier community. And so I think there are a variety of things we need to do. Let me commend the work that the water department is doing, separating our stormwater and our sewer. There's more work that needs to be done there. They're doing a great job. I think we need to make transit investments, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about that. But if there's one thing that I can do as mayor, it's making sure that everyone has sidewalks so that they can move around their community. And it doesn't mean on every single street. Certainly in low-density neighborhoods, there are going to be fewer sidewalks. But in places where we're connecting kids to schools and folks in neighborhoods to small businesses, we need to make Thank sure that they much. can get there. Sure hurt. The biggest thing for me is our sewage and our water system. You know, we have homes that have been built in single parcels, and now we're putting four, five, six, seven houses on those parcels. And you've got twice, 10 times as much usage. I'm afraid that our piping system, especially with it being 100 plus years old, and all of them leading over to Vanderbilt, that we are going to blow up in our system. And I'm very concerned about that. And I think we need to do an overhaul as the EPA has already uh, slated us and declared and decreed for us to do is get our water system and our storm water systems together. We have too, absolutely too much flooding in our system. And I think we need to address that immediately. And that would be what it is that I would do. I want to go back to that last question because as mayor, one thing I would definitely do is make sure that the COB and the police are working together. The COB has already given the, the police 22 complaints and policies that they have effected. And I think that that is really important in order for us to address those issues that we've had. They've had over 200 complaints from our community, and that builds the trust with the police and the community. Thank you very much. Jim Gingrich? So, David, I'm going to ask, answer your question, uh, but it's going to be at the end because this is such a long list. <laughs> you know, when you grow and you don't do the things that you need to do, when you grow, you have a long list. It, it's, it's water, it's sewer, it's storm water. It's, it's the transportation system, it's sidewalks, it's, you know, we're out of landfill capacity, so we have a major waste management issue, green space. We have talked about this forever. What I hear from people time and again is that development is going in, but where is the infrastructure plan that is going to go with that development? Why does the infrastructure always follow the growth as opposed to having leaders in place that actually are capable of thinking ahead and willing to make the investments as opposed to kicking the can time and time again? Now, what I will tell you in terms of the major priority that I hear every time I knock on the door is with all I'm paying in taxes, why can't you keep my roads in good condition? particularly in neighborhoods that have been ignored for such a long time. Why am I hitting potholes? Do you know how many times my personal windshield is broken this year by a stone being thrown out of, out of, a, out of a pothole? Three times. I can't tell you how many folks who tell me about tires blowing out. If we can't do that, we can't do everything Thank you very else. Much. Vivian Wilhoit? Jim Gingrich, you took my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so he's right. You drove over here today, and guess what? You hit a pothole. I guarantee you. Tell me one of you who did not. 
or you are riding along the road that needs to, you were in your own neighborhood. That's why we have to have economic parity. <laughs> okay? That's why we got to have economic parity right there. But my point is, that's correct. I mean, we do have a lot of things that we want to have as our priority. You know, I sit here and think about one of the priorities. I don't want to see Bordeaux landfill to be, to be expanded. That's an infrastructure in of itself, an environmental injustice for it to be expanded without having people at the table. But going back to the streets, it is important that we have our roads paved, not only on the highways, but in our communities. I mean, our cars, when we seek options to make sure that we can, you know, have mass transit, take the bus or what have you, but we don't want the bus driver to hit a pothole and everybody on his passenger, all the passengers on the bus could get hurt or the, a tire blow out. Or you have to maintain your car. These sound like simple things, but you know what? They are simple, but they mean a lot to us. So I do believe getting the roads paved, getting that pothole that I hit every day paved. Because you, if you try to sue Metro, you're not going to win. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff Yarbrough. So I think you're seeing a theme here, and I think it makes sense. I think everybody in the, in the city understands that growth is going like that, but the infrastructure and services are currently slated to catch up with that growth in about 75 years, like after we're long gone, and that is insufficient, and the next mayor has to be a leader in moving that forward in, in terms of you know, setting priorities and getting the work done. I agree with Vivian and Jim that probably the thing I hear the most about out there in the world is roads. Uh, and it should be possible to drive to work or to drop your kids off at school without using a GPS every single morning. It should be able to, you should be able to drive in Nashville without needing a degree in tire maintenance or having to do work on your car all the time. But that is increasingly just the way of life here. Uh, since I've got a little bit of time, I'm going to go ahead and give you my second too, which is uh, it doesn't get as much attention and there's never a groundbreaking for it. But if we don't have the water system and the sewer stormwater water system actually working for the city, it's going to be a long, difficult future for, our, for the city that we live in. And that is long, boring work. It happens underground. Like I said, there's no, it is rare that you have a big ceremony when that happens. But when it fails, we all know and we all know quick. And so I think there's a lot of work to do in both of those places and in all the other areas that people discussed. Thank you. Ellis Riley. Yeah, I think the area that our infrastructure is most failing in is our city's balance sheet. Right now, the line item that we spend the second most dollars on after school is our city's debt. And that's debt created by a lot of folks on the stage over the last 15 years, spending consistently more money than we've taken in. So it means that we've been sold a story that growth will pay for growth, but the reality is that it's not. So if I had to choose a sort of a utility separate from the dollars that we we're going to spend on that, it would be in addition to roads, our electricity grid. Our seniors who are at home alone or who are reliant on different types of medical devices really struggle when we have three days without power in a summer storm. So we've got to get serious first about paying attention to the operations of our city, uh, and that starts with paying attention to our debt. So one question frequently comes up with that, how do you match the cost of growth at the site of growth? And this takes having a perspective that I alone on the state have from working at an executive level with the state and the federal government. In 2006, the County Powers Act stopped our county's ability to capture the cost of growth at the site of growth. We have the ability to work with regional mayors who are also experiencing this same challenge and to reverse this nearly two decades law and to help us in our city pay for growth at the site of growth. Thank you. Freddie O'Connell. It's David. Um, when I was starting to get serious about the campaign, a friend was thinking with me about the future of the city and said, we've been promised all these nice things and we just keep building nicer ways to watch sports. And it feels true, and it's even worse when we build a nice way to watch sports that no one can get to. Uh, last year, uh, we watched Geodis Park open for Nashville SC's home game, and if you could take a bus on a weekday, you couldn't take it home. On the weekends, even on game days, we had not figured out how to run our transit system there. 
Uh, we had not paved sidewalks into the surrounding uh, communities to allow our locals who love Nashville SC best uh, to be able to get easily to the soccer stadium. Uh, this was for a new asset that we knew was coming three years earlier. Um, we just reorganized a big part of our government as the what used to be the Public Works Department in Metro is now a mouthful. It's the Nashville Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure, and that speaks to the crisis. We are fortunately in a position where we are starting to think more seriously about state of good repair, about sidewalk delivery after a year of tragic pedestrian deaths, uh, about better transit access, and that's going to be the most critical of all. We are the last major American city uh, without a meaningful transit system, and putting all of that together and giving people safer, easier, more convenient ways to move around the city and access the nice things we've built is critically important and be top of my list. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. So the number one infrastructure problem that we deal with is people. Um, the, the growth has outpaced our infrastructure. And this seems like an overwhelming problem, but it isn't. Um, as the mayor of Oak Hill, and I'm the only person here who has actually been a mayor, when I came into office, uh, we had spent down our reserves by half, and I realized that we needed to streamline our operations. I eliminated my own salary. Um, we, we tightened our belts, and we found the resources to make sure that we could actually handle the infrastructure in our city. Um, we have big infrastructure problems in this city. I serve on the Transportation Committee in the State Senate, and we just passed the largest infrastructure bill in the history of our state. We actually have the funds right now to deal with some of the multimodal issues, the sidewalks, um, paving. It's a big paving plan. Um, and we can also look towards um, you know, other, other funding to actually um, like the fact that we have downtown um, private developers building smart city technology right now that we can expand upon. And that increases efficiency. So we really need to look at increasing efficiency, and it doesn't have to be an either or. We can, in a fiscally responsible way, actually improve our infrastructure problems significantly. All right, we're going to mix things up a little bit now and allow each of the candidates to ask a question of another candidate. The questions must be directed to a single candidate, and that person will have 90 seconds to respond, and we'll begin with Sharon Hurt. Okay, let me see. Matt, tell me what it is that you would do and be different from all of your predecessors who have been white, men just like you T to reach all of the forgotten and neglected communities. Sure. Uh, well, there was one mayor that was not a white man, a white woman. Uh, but um, it is a great question, and it is an important question. Um, so uh, when, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking a lot about the diversity of this city. And um, there, it is absolutely vital that we have a city administration that reflects the beautiful diversity of this city. So I commit as mayor that my administration will reflect the diversity of this city in all the ways, gender, racial, geographic diversity, um, ethnic diversity, uh, political diversity, because folks should feel connected to the administration. And you are right. For far too long, the folks who've been mayor have come from one particular, uh, one particular part of our city. And it should reflect the diversity. I think the diversity on the stage is actually a wonderful thing. Um, the gender and racial diversity on the stage does not fully reflect the city. But in many ways, it's half women, 25% black, roughly the breakdown of our city. And I think that's a great thing for our city to show the progress that we've made. But we have a long way to go. And I commit, as mayor, to have the kind of staff that's in touch with the community. Because if you aren't listening to people, then you can't truly serve them. Thank you. And I believe in servant leadership. Uh, just a note on the time, you will have 90 seconds for the answer. So the clock started a little early there, so I gave you some, the, I'm a sorry, full, no, you. I gave you a full 90 seconds. I, I appreciate it. All right, we'll go next to Jim Gingrich. So I was recently approached by advocates uh, for the new NASCAR Speedway and told that if I don't change my position on the Speedway, I would be personally and politically attacked uh, publicly. 
I'm actually going to make it easy. I would just ask everyone here to raise their hand if they have ever had a special interest threaten them if they did not change their position on an issue. Just raise your hand. Any more specifics you want to offer? I, I just, I, I'm happy if anybody raises their hand. D didn't you say individually? Ask the yeah, it should be. Individually. Yeah. So, That's not the rule, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> That's your question? That is my question. And I've right. been threatened, but not by a special okay. interest group. <laughs> we will move on. Vivian, Will Hoyt, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so asking a question. I have a, okay. Alice Rowley. So you said in one of the debates, kind of made me cringe a little bit. You stated that if you were mayor, you would not allow the Metro Courthouse to be a place to protest. So tell me, how are you going to be mayor and diminish a person's First Amendment right to freedom of speech? Well, that's a great question. I don't think that I said that. I think what I said is that in my city hall, we won't have a pro-life rally or a pro-choice rally, meaning I will not nationalize city hall. Because when we have nationalized city hall, it's hurt Nashvillians. So if somebody wants, someone else wants to have a pro-life or a pro-choice rally, that's great. But as the mayor, when I received a few weeks ago the Planned Parenthood endorsement questionnaire, the questionnaire led with, this is a state legislative questionnaire. And so I actually wrote back that it was inappropriate for an individual seeking the office of mayor to ask for an endorsement for a group that is fully focused on state and federal issues. The same way if the National Right to Life wrote me and asked me to fill out a questionnaire, I would answer their question in the same way. I believe in principled neutrality, and I believe that if we want our city to be a welcoming place, we cannot start to pick and choose if the NRA is allowed to come here, which we allowed them to come here a few years ago, or if the National Republican Convention, we sent them a letter saying they're not allowed to come. So what I'm saying is that as, as mayor, we will not operate in these national political uh, interests. We will not use City Hall as a backdrop. We will care less about the color that the bridge is and more about are the potholes on the bridge filled. We will care more about having a pro first graders reading rally. We will care more about a pro supporting our infrastructure rally and less about national political issues. Next is Jeff Yarbrough. Okay. Um, so my question is for Matt. Um, your campaign has talked a lot about its success in fundraising, but there is, I'm looking at an invitation where you went down to Texas and had an event there that was hosted by Ted Cruz's treasurer. And I've seen your explanation out there that this is that there's a family connection. But like, I think you are smart enough to know that people are gonna know Ted Cruz's te te treasurer in Texas. I just want uh, you to give it a chance to actually fully explain that. Sure, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. So um, the event that you're talking about was a fundraising event uh, that my cousin and her husband uh, and two colleagues of my wife hosted in Austin, um, a place where my mother, who's here, hey mom, went to college and my grandmother went to college. I've got family in Austin. Um, and it was wonderful to get back and see family and be connected with them. Um, Brad, my, uh, my cousin's husband, and I don't always agree politically. In fact, frequently we don't. But he's family, and I love Brad. And to the point more broadly, I think in every one of the forums we've had, we've been asked, what are you going to be able to do to extend a hand across the aisle and be able to build better relationships with the state? Now, I think that this is a great example. My Democratic bona fides are the best of, I think, any of the candidates up here. Actually, technically, the scores on Vote Builder and the other platforms. And my donation history is clear. My parents' uh, work in the community is clear. So I don't think that's in question. I think it's fantastic that someone with that track record, voting record, is able to attract donations, by the way, in a nonpartisan race. Um, 
speaks to an ability, as I did when I was in the mayor's office and at MDHA, to extend a hand and work productively in nonpartisan ways with folks from across the aisle. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. Alice Rowley. Great. Yeah, well, I also have a question for Matt. I guess he's on the hot seat today. <laughs> I was so delighted, Matt, um, to receive um, your subscription to my campaign newsletter recently that I took your email address and I looked over the 5,000 names who had signed up for the citizens' petition to stop the development at Fort Negley under the previous mayor who you worked for. So I wanted to know how you uh, approached that plan to put 27 buildings on protected historic public parkland, and if you would consider those types of backdoor deals in your administration. So um, I'm not sure I exactly followed the question, but I think you were saying, would I support something like the redevelopment of Fort Negley? Is that the, the question? It. No, you didn't support so backdoor stopping deals. It. Sure, you didn't sure. Support I, I mean, look, I think that Fort Negley is an absolutely um, vital asset in our city, and one that I've actually spoken about in my policy books that I've released uh, online. Talked about the importance of investing in Fort Negley and in open space. Um, it had been neglected by our city for far too long, and I think it is a wonderful thing. Um, I think it is unfortunate that now, four years after that, anyone who drives past Fort Negley sees that it's still behind a chain link fence with uh, weeds growing up. And I am very hopeful. And as mayor, I commit to make sure that it is restored and uh, held up as a beautiful place that folks can come and enjoy. Now, I am, uh, to your question, I guess, not in favor of backdoor deals. Um, I'm in favor of everything having transparency and being talked about. I commit to that as mayor, um, and I think it is absolutely important to show the historical significance of our city and to hold up the folks who actually built the city in the first place. And in the example of Fort Negley, that includes slaves and former slaves who had been um, captured, who were the ones who actually built that and then helped free our country um, in the Civil War, and I absolutely will hold that up in the highest regard. So thank you for asking that question. When you had the chance to oh, sign the petition, that's, you didn't. That's time. Yeah. We'll have to an, add another moment. Do we have to move there on? There are lots of petitions I don't sign. I'm sorry I missed that. We are tight on time. And audience, please, if you could just refrain from comments, we'd appreciate it. We said we'd mix things up. Next is Freddie O'Connell. Great. Thanks, Rory. Uh, it clearly makes for good TV to ask these challenge questions. Um, but we're also trying to elect a mayor up here. I had the good fortune of working with literally all of the candidates on the stage. I know their commitments to the city. Uh, and I don't think 90 seconds from anybody is going to help us do better than our campaigns are doing, and I'm going to yield my time. I know we're tight. Thanks. Okay. Heidi Campbell. Uh, yeah, so I would like to ask um, a question of my colleague um, Vivian, who answered a Q&A recently that I saw, uh, where you talked about how too many underserved neighborhoods don't have sidewalks. And I really, just like in the last forum when I asked um, uh, Councilwoman Hurt about her work in HIV, this is a very interesting topic to me and near and dear to my heart and something that I worked on in the city of Oak Hill um, in terms of sidewalks. And I'd love to, I'd love to know, you know what your thoughts are on that. Sure. Cities of, uh, the, city, um, the city of Nashville, Davidson County, when I served as a two-term council person, if we could have paid for sidewalks, we would have not gotten them because it was, it was just petty politics that was being played from time to time. Kicking the, can to down, kicking the can down the road over and over again. So, Senator Campbell, yes, I believe that we should be able to provide sidewalks even in light of the recent court decision. It's all about budgeting, it's all about being intentional, and it's all about putting people first. Finally, Matt Wiltshire. Great. After the way this has gone, I feel like I should ask myself a question, but um, <laughs> I, will, I will follow the rules. Um, and, and my question is for Ms. Rowley. Um, so you have spoken, I think, in each of our forums, including here today, uh, about the amount of debt that the city has and that it's uh, terrible, the amount of debt that the city has. As I'm sure you know, um, we have a double-A bond rating, and the debt that the city has is actually money that was incurred to build capital assets, to build schools to build sidewalks, to pave streets, to fix stormwater. And so my question for you is, what school would you not have built? What sidewalk would you not have constructed? And what street would you not have paved in order to not have the debt that the city has today? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question, Matt. Um, we do today in our city's budget that was just passed have $413 million in debt. The entire state of Tennessee combined for the same period of time has $342 million in debt. And Matt is correct that our bond rating is a reflection of the market's belief that we can raise your taxes. It is a belief that we can and that everyone else on this stage will raise your taxes in this next term to be able to meet that bond obligation. So the broader question is, how is governing from a different approach, an approach that I have come from and why our state is actually the lowest debt state in the country? And that is first that we had always taken, beginning in 1978, a pay-as-you-go approach to how we funded roads and how we funded schools. So it is an excellent question to say if we continue doing what we've done for the last 20 years and continue to elect people that take a tax and spend, kick the can down the road, consistently looking consistently uh, at the lines, our population looks like this, our spending looks like this, and our revenues look like this. And if we continue to do that, you will not be able to spend any money on the things that a lot of people are talking about wanting to spend money on. Right. I didn't hear an answer. You did hear an answer. It is What's a different really? approach. Okay. Yeah. Got to move on. Sorry. Right. Right. Thank you. We'll come back to regular programming now. Um, <laughs> African Americans make up roughly 27% of Nashville's population, but the black community has borne the brunt of gentrification in recent years. It's also been hit hard by health disparities, struggling schools, and rising crime rates. What specifically will you do as mayor to ensure that Nashville's African American community isn't left behind? Jim Gingrich. Uh, that is a great question, David, and uh, it is absolutely true that uh, our African American communities have been promised lots of things over the years. Uh, and yet, we consistently show, uh, whether or not that is little things or big things, that we are not prioritizing every community. Uh, little things like, what neighborhoods is power restored first? And where is it restored last? What streets do we salt before a storm? These are things that need to change. You know, Clarksville Highway is going to be a priority for me. The, 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 and then on big things, uh, Freddie touched on a large investment in a stadium. The largest ever public subsidy in the history of sport. We're now talking about a new raceway, again, with a billionaire involved that will be 100% paid for with public money. And yet we can't sort out what we're going to do with Nashville General Hospital. These are things that the mayor has to make a priority, not just in terms of, of where we invest, because we were talking about a whole bunch of infrastructure issues earlier. That infrastructure has to go to the neighborhoods that need it most. Just look at what Thank sidewalks are repaired and which Thank are you. not. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I started this campaign on the very platform that I've talked about, closing the gap on economic parity of neighborhoods that are sitting in the same tax district but not getting the services. That's where it starts. It starts with assessing all of these neighborhoods and not being equal in providing the services but being fair because there's some, there's some neighborhood that doesn't need the resources. Senator Campbell said it once in her, in her own words, that her neighborhood doesn't need sidewalks. It's not like as if there are sidewalks needed, or some of that type of nature she stated. That's because her neighborhood already has what it needs. So now you have the opportunity. You know an African-American woman in charge is not going to forget her own community, but nor am I going to forget your community. And it's about doing the right thing. It's about being intentional, unapologetic. It's about doing the right thing. It makes me sad when I hear that we are always left behind. But that stops today. I ask you for your vote. Thank you. Jeff Yarbrough? One of the clearest leadership tasks ahead of 
the next mayor is making sure that the, kit, the city continues to move forward without leaving people behind. That's what we have to do. I think one of the ways that this city has long distinguished itself from peer cities in the country and especially in the region is our aspirations to break down ra racial barriers. I mean, you can look from the founding of Fisk in 1866 to the way that ABC al alumni like John Lewis and C.T. Vivian worked in the 1960s to lead Nashville to be one of the first southern cities to, to break down you know, uh, retail segregation. But we oftentimes fall far short of those aspirations. I think that we don't live up to our promise and it's going to take significant leadership to ensure that we do. Uh, so one, I think that starts with a mayor who's committed. Two, I think it requires building a team who has not just the the expertise, but also the experience and diversity of, of experiences to ensure that voices are at the table. It takes a commitment to making sure that we are not planning projects for neighborhoods, but plan, pr planning projects with communities. And that certainly applies to the African American community, but it applies br much more broadly across this city, because I think we oftentimes see that City Hall has plans for our neighborhood, plans for our part of town, plans for the our part of the city without actually asking us first, without working with us much. on what the future is. Ellis Rowley. Yeah, so as a former public high school teacher and as a parent, I think our greatest failing is our failure to teach our kids to read. We see in the data that today only 25% of our children across Metro Nashville Public Schools are reading proficiently, and that is down from 10 years ago when it was 40%. Our enrollment is declining, our scores are declining, but our budgets are exploding. And there's no accountability first to say that all children in this city are our children. All children in this city deserve to be taught to read, and in particular, black and brown children whose rates of reading are closer to 18 and 19 percent. It should make every parent and every taxpayer in this city angry <clears throat> that we are dooming our children to a future of failure. When I meet with the Senate, the House, excuse me, Education Subcommittee Chairman on Education, and he says to me, Alice, what scares me the most is that when we are testing incarcerated individuals coming into our state prison system, men are reading at a first grade level and women are reading at a third grade level. We are knowingly, for generations, dooming our children to failure, and we know how to fix it. We have schools in the city that parents want to send their children to. We need to create the space in the time and we need to support the science of literacy instruction across all of our schools. Thank you. Freddie O'Connell. David, thanks. And it's, I just want to appreciate the League of Women Voters, News Channel 5 and the Tennessean for asking that question here on the historic campus of American Baptist College. It's great to be able to have this forum in a space that has been a legendary educator of people, including civil rights leaders, and I want my administration to be an uh, example of justice, equity, advocacy, and leadership, as we heard from Dr. Harris earlier. Um, when 16 years ago I moved to the 37208 zip code, I had a lot to learn, and I started first as a neighborhood leader, working on projects, building partnerships in our community, but. I knew I had moved into a diverse working class neighborhood. What I didn't know at the time was that I had moved into a zip code uh, that if you had been born there from 1980 to 1986 in a historically black part of the city, you were more likely to wind up incarcerated than anywhere in the United States of America. So we started tackling that. We addressed punitive fines and fees, giving people more money in their pockets. Over the past five years, we put millions of dollars back into the pockets of people, part of whose interactions with the criminal legal system was because they were too poor to post bond. This is the process of starting to repair those harms of mass incarceration. Going forward, if we look at the demographic characteristics of our metro schools, it's almost the inverse of the population uh, percentages you stated earlier, David. And so that means every dollar we invest in metro schools, from our capital budget to our teachers to our support staff is an investment in the future of black children, and I intend to do that. Thank you very much. Heidi Campbell. It's 2023, and we are still one of the most redlined cities in the country. And, um, you know, we have a movement to hide or erase the systemic racism um, that we are still experiencing, and, and that's indefensible. 
Um, you know, I was actually talking to David earlier about a movie um, that the National Public Education Foundation did called By Design that talks about the history of desegregation in Nashville and how particularly difficult it was in Nashville because of how redlined we are. We have such haves and have-nots in this city where in my area of town, you have a school like Glendale that does so well because you have parents who put hundreds of thousands of dollars into that school. And then you have other areas with schools that are really struggling because, you know, you have parents, single moms that are working two jobs to try to make ends meet. We have to triage those inequities or we will all not do well. We will all do better when we all do better. And, you know, I push back a little bit at, at the idea that we have been leaders in this. I think from great adversity comes great leadership. Leadership, and that's why we had the John, John Lewis and Diane Nash, because this has been such an historically racist city. Um, it is our job to, to, to triage that inequity, and it, it starts with making sure that everybody is getting a fair chance. Thank you. Matt Wilshire? By Design is a great film, and for anyone who hasn't seen it, I'd highly recommend you take a look. The Nashville Public Education Foundation produced it, and it really is instructive to our history and how we got here. Um, and Nashville has been unfair for far too long for far too many people. It has been unfair. There is a lot of work that we need to do as a city. Uh, my parents did that work. Uh, my mother was a professor at Fisk and then at Vanderbilt. My father was the executive director of the Legal Aid Society, which is like the public defender, but for civil cases for 30 years. And they instilled in my sister Carrie and me the importance of making sure that everyone Everyone in this city deserves an equal shot. It is both fair and good for us as a city. Why should we want only some of the people to have an equal chance? We should want everyone to have an equal shot. It's better, it's more fair, it's the right thing to do. And so I have done this in roles in certain ways in the mayor's office when we created a small business incentive program that provided incentives for small businesses to invest in neighborhoods that have been neglected for far too long. When I moved to MDHA, we worked on redeveloping areas of public housing into thriving mixed income, mixed use neighborhoods, but we did it without displacing any families so that the social fabric of those networks could remain while their communities improved. And those are the principles that I will lead as mayor to make sure that everyone has much. a chance to succeed. Sharon Hurt. You know, I'm so excited because it seems like it's a, consist a consensus that everyone up here believes that there is time for a change, and I am the change that this city needs. I am so happy. I'm asking you for your support and your vote because I have transformed the community to nonprofits and hundreds of people along the way in the African American community, along with other work that I've done outside and throughout this entire community at large. I will support Nashville General Hospital. I will make sure that we continue with a workforce development program that I started some years ago, like in 2013, before I became a council member. I will continue to do that work. Imagine what it is that I could do if I become, or when I become mayor. I will make sure that we provide shuttle services for our seniors as I did in 2012. I have already added 25% to the stadium deal for small minority and women owned businesses because I want to create wealth, build hope, restore prosperity to that community. As mayor, I will make sure that all boats rise doing all, all both rise with this rising tide that we have in this community. I am so excited that you all agree. Thank hey, you. Thank you very much. All right, our final question. We have to reduce your time to answer to 60 seconds. I recently interviewed Butch Spiridon, who retired last week after 32 years leading the Nashville Convention and Visitors Corporation. He was upset that the new Titan Stadium had been labeled a tourism toy in recent candidate debates. He went on to say, and I quote, that is an insult and an underestimation of that building for this city and this region. Do you agree or not with Butch's statement? We'll begin with Vivian Wilhoyt. Well, for the people who made the statement, it is a tourism toy because those people feel like Nashville has not been strong for them. But for me, I see it as an opportunity to move forward 
and make sure that we do what is necessary to make sure that Nashville is strong for everyone. Okay. Jeff Yarbrough. Yeah, I think that that is an a improper way to really talk about this because the job <clears throat> of the next mayor is to ensure that this city succeeds. Part of that success will be making sure that the stadium project goes forward, making sure that the East Bank develops around it. Our job is to make that work and make it work for more people in the city. That's the job, the leadership task that's ahead. That means making it work for citizens, making it affordable, making sure that the public investment leads to benefits for the public. It means making sure that we're making it not just affordable, but walkable and getting the type of, of, of true community impact and benefits that the cit citizens of Nashville deserve. I'm Jeff Yarbrough and I'm asking for your vote because this is a time when this city needs leadership to move in the right direction, to handle the big steps, the, the big issues in front of us like this and like making the balance between li life, work, and play in this growing city. Thank you. Alice Rowley. Yeah, um, I don't think I've characterized it as a toy, um, but I do think that we as citizens have to see that we took a stake and we paid more for a new stadium than any other city in the country. And so that begs the question, if we can take that kind of a moonshot stake for our tourism and economy, why can't we for our education or other aspects of our economy? Why can't we believe that like other cities, we can go from failing to an A-rated school system? I would say that the job of the next mayor is being able to work effectively with the state to be able to leverage state dollars that it will take to build the infrastructure in and out of that stadium and that uniquely I'm positioned to be able to do that. I don't spend my time making fun of our other state legislators on Instagram. I don't spend time besmirching our neighboring counties for how they conduct their own business. I spend time building bridges and making things happen. And by doing that, we can bring those dollars to build out the infrastructure that that stadium will need. Freddie O'Connell. Rory, I was sitting in the Metro Council Chamber uh, when the finance team that was presenting the stadium deal to us uh, described it as a Las Vegas-like attractor, uh, principally for people from not inside Nashville. Um, there's no question that part of the intent of the design is to attract people, and one of the reasons uh, our volunteers' t-shirts say Mooreville, Las Vegas, is because the project we've been about for the past year and more is trying to build a Nashville for Nashvillians. That's what the job of the next mayor is. I want to focus the resources, the spending priorities, the executive function of the mayor's office on making it easier for people to stay in this city. That's the entire reason I started running for mayor is because I knew our priorities were misaligned. Uh, fundamentally, I disagree with Butch's assessment uh, and I hope to earn the votes of people who want us to get back on the right track because I want you to stay. My name's Freddie O'Connell. Be honored to earn your vote tonight. Heidi Campbell. It's been mischaracterized in this race um, as an either or, and it's a false premise. Of course, we would all rather see funds put into education and affordable housing, um, but you know that wasn't the offer. And so the mayor, the mayor's job is not to complain, complain about the things that are going wrong, but to find a way to solve problems. So we can complain about all kinds of things that have gone, gone wrong, but the fact of the matter is that decision has been made and the job of a mayor, what you want to see in a mayor, is somebody who is able to move forward with Nashvillians benefiting the most from the plans that are being made from here on. Not to make an entire campaign about complaining about something that has already been done. And so, um, so I, uh, my name is Heidi Campbell, and my website is voteheidicampbell.com, and I released a whole entire policy platform. I ask you to go to my website and take a look. My phone number is on the website. Please give me a call if you have questions. Thank you. Matt Wiltshire. I think those kind of petty uh -huh. political labels are ultimately unhelpful to the overall discussion, but I think they do reflect a real frustration a lot of Nashvillians are feeling. I think it is important going forward that we focus on the things that actually make your life better. How do we actually make sure that we have the best performing public education system in the entire country? We can do that. 
if we work together with great schools like ABC to train the best teachers, to make sure that we have opportunities for kids, we can do that. We need to make sure that we have a safe city where we're both addressing those who commit crimes, but getting at the root underlying causes of crime. And we can do that when we have a quality of life with affordable housing, transit, infrastructure, parks, and green space. And so there have been a lot of political battles. There have been lots of things thrown around here today. But what's important is we focus on how we make your life better. And we can do that. We work together. I'm Matt Wilshire. I'd appreciate your vote. Sharon Hurt. Where there's no vision, the people will perish. But where there is vision, they will flourish. The stadium is an economic tool. We are going to have an economic tsunami. And the money that is going to come from that will take care of the schools, our infrastructure, our police, all of those things that are important to us. That's why I'm so glad that I was able to get that 25% for small minority and women owned businesses deal because that means $600,000 a day will come back to the community for the next three years. Then it opens up the opportunity for the East Bank, which is going to be a 10 times, do 10 times deal better than that. So I ask for your vote. I am Sharon Hurt, Sharon for Nashville.com. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. So it's no secret that last July uh, I spoke out uh, on the stadium. Uh, it is now a done deal. I don't think a mayor should be retrading deals that a that, uh, previous mayor had negotiated. However, I do think where people stood on this issue says a lot about their level of fiscal responsibility as well as their priorities. The fact is there have been eight NFL stadiums that have been constructed in the last 15 years most with little or no public money. And the reason for that is because it so increases the value of a team. Now we, as a city, are gonna be funding, combined with the state, a subsidy that is nearly 70% higher than the previously worst deal. So what does it say for the fact that just about everybody up here said, I support this? We need somebody in office who does not cater to special interests and actually works for the people of Nashville. Okay. We want to thank all of you for joining us tonight, answering our questions and answering each other's questions as well. We appreciate it. We appreciate the audience, and we want to thank uh, everyone who made this possible, especially the folks here at American Baptist College, who again will be celebrating their 100th anniversary next year. A little tease, be watching News Channel 5 for some stories on that for sure. A reminder, folks, early voting starts next Friday, July 14th, runs through the 29th, Election Day, four weeks from today, August 3rd. So get out and vote. On behalf of my colleague David Plazas with The Tennessean, I'm Rory Johnston with News Channel 5. Thanks and have a great evening.